The story for the Planet of the Spiders is at a Tibetan retreat in the English countryside. A group of men are using ancient meditation rituals to tap into a mysterious alien power. They unwittingly create a bridgehead between Earth and Metabilius III, a planet where the two legs are oppressed by giant spiders. The creatures are desperate to recover the blue jewel that the doctor gave to Joe Grant as a wedding gift. Now the doctor must risk everything and return to Metabilius III to face the awesome power of the Great One, who plans to use the crystal to enslave all of humankind. I have to admit, I was quite impressed with Planet of the Spiders. I thought it was a really interesting story uh, overall. I thought I, I liked the story of, of just finding the blue crystal and bringing back the blue crystal. It was, it was uh, nice to harken back to the Green Death, where he gave it gave the blue crystal to Joe as a wedding gift, and the fact that she gave it back to the Doctor because in, in her travels in the Amazon she couldn't keep it because the natives said it was something evil and they couldn't let her let her and her husband pass through anywhere, so she had to give it back to the Doctor. And it was nice to remember Joe and and know that she's happy where she is, and uh, and, and also bridge bridge the two story together with the uh, with the blue crystal. And I was quite inter interested the, by the fact that for the eleven years that Doctor Who's been around in the series thus far, um, they've always used household items or bugs to scare people, and they never used stuff about spiders until this point. I was quite impressed by that. I was like, wow, they never used spiders before, and now they are. And I still have a little bit of an arachnophobia, so this this story did scare me a little bit, or at least creep me out a few times. Uh, and speaking of the spiders, I was quite impressed with the spiders, period. Both creepy and scary, and scared by them, but they were still impressive. Um, yes, most of them were just animatronic puppets. In fact, these, this was early animatronics. This was even before they even coined the phrase animatronics. Uh, and the puppetry animatronics for these spiders were fantastic, quite believable. Yes, you can tell it's wire puppet work and the, and the way they move, but still it was quite impressive and pretty cool and kind of creepy at times. I mean, um, it was just just the movement of them was just w was just quite entertaining and, and just kind of um, engaging. And then also when they do other regular puppet work, like they had one that, that was kind of a motor that crawled across the floor. That was just kind of a little creepy. And then they had one uh, that was quite both scary and at the same time quite impressive was they had one that was on the floor and it would just go, like, go down like this and then all of a sudden it just jumped up. And I was like, well, that was interesting how they did that. And I was just like, oh, that's both cool, but also creepy, because, oh, ugh. And I still have that little bit of arachnophobia. Uh, so the spiders were quite impressive. The design of the spiders were very scary and quite believable. And in fact, the great one is actually blue screened in. It's just, you know, the one of the, one of the spiders just redesigned and then just blown up to this huge proportion. And that was pretty creepy, but at the same time, well done with both blue screen and the animatronics. But I do have to admit, the blue screen still needs work. It is still, it's slowly progressing, but it still needs work, because when it's just a, when it was the, the great one, the big spider, it was fine, because, you know, it fit, you know, it fit well, perfectly in there. But when they put John Pertwee in front of it, it's just, he doesn't really fit much into it. In fact, especially when they do backdrops of, like, landscapes, nothing fits. <laughs> And it's like, it's just, you could tell, it's blue screen, and it's just like, uh, it would have been better if you just did a matte painting or just something to to fit in, because it just, it just didn't work. Um, the set designs were great. The, uh, at this one, had a, episode two was pretty good, pretty much just a chase scene, and it, even though, yes, it was something that probably didn't necessarily need to be in there, the entire episode didn't need to be a chase scene, but still, the chasing was fun. I mean, you got cars, you got Bessie, you got the Who-mobile, you even got this new one, the Who. I think it was called the Who-copter. I can't remember exactly, but it was the gyro. It was the gyrocopter that you. If you guys seen the movie, the Bond film, you only live twice. In that, in a scene, a Bond drives around this a small little helicopter um, around a volcano, and they have that chopper. Not the same one, and not the same design, but it's the same type of model. And they used that for the for this episode. It was pretty cool uh, and fun. It was like you know what this. It's it just like I always said, John Pertwee's the James Bond of all the Doctors, and this just pretty much just sealed the deal. 
but the episode was kind of fun. It was it showed that you know the John Pertwee episodes were more action adventure type of things. Um, I liked. Um, I also liked how there was some good character development in this one, uh, particularly in the character of Tommy. There's a new character they brought in called Tommy, who's this uh, mentally challenged person who has hard trouble reading and just gets picked on by uh, by all the people at the uh, at the meditation clinic. And then he comes into contact with the, the Blue Crystal, and the Blue Crystal makes him intelligent. And even though he's intelligent, uh, there's at one point that Sarah goes, Tommy, you, you changed. You're just like everybody else. And he goes, I certainly hope not. <laughs> which, which just goes to show that even though he gained intelligence and he kind of becomes like everybody else, he still wants to be his own person. He doesn't want to act like everybody else. He wants to be an individual, which was quite interesting and also also quite a good message and theme for uh, little kids, but also to everybody else, to not always be like everybody else, to just be your own person. That was a nice little touch. Um, and it was also interesting, also, the fact that, if you remember in the story, The Time Monster, the doctor tells Joe about this, um, this mentor he had that lived on a hill that taught, basically taught him the meaning of life, or, you know, of, of life and period. Well, that person's uh, the head of the uh, meditation clinic. And we get to see him, and he actually points out to the doctor, you know, that basically this is all his fault, you know, and, uh, the doctor admits it, and he, he's like, um, yeah, you're right, because of my greed, my greed for knowledge. I am greedy, I want knowledge. And that uh, was quite interesting, the fact that the, the doctor admits that, and also has pointed out to the doctor, that he is fallible. He is not invincible, he is not um, perfect. Uh, and that was interesting to me, that, I was just quite amazed by that, and showed a good character development, not only, not only character, somebody to point out to the doctor that he, is infall that he is not perfect, but the fact that the doctor admits it and accepts it. That uh, was quite interesting. And speaking of that scene, this story is the first story to actually use the term regeneration. Because uh, the mentor is basically on his last limbs, uh, the doctor explains to Sarah that he's going to regenerate soon. And that mean, and he just basically defines that when a Time Lord's body wears down, he regenerates into a new form. And so that was interesting, because beforehand, with the, first, with the second doctor, he, always, he called it a renewal. Or, um, at the end of the Second Doctor's time, the Time Lords call it a change of appearance. So, finally we get an actual term, and that is regeneration. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, um, sto this, this story actually, like I said before, it marks the last, the last John Pertree story. And we actually do get to see his regeneration at the end of the story, where after... You know, he gets affected by the radiation of the the crystals. The the, the whole this whole crystal it's by the big one. And the final piece gets put in, and the radiation just affects the doctor. When he comes back, he basically dies from the radiation, and you know he does regenerate. The scene itself of his regeneration was quite sad and teary, but the regeneration itself not as good as it was before. <laughs> I mean, the first doctor we had like a glowing light. Uh, that was shown on his face, and then he fades into the second Doctor. The second Doctor, we didn't see his regeneration. He just kind of strewn his face, and then he just slowly goes into the darkness, and we don't see it. Well, this one, it's just a fade. He just fades into Tom Baker. And I was like, okay, all right, not glamorous, but okay, fine, we'll take it. But it, it just could have been treated better, but I, I guess because, you know, it's with the end of each episode of the serials, they always rush to their endings, so I guess they kind of had to rush through the regeneration to end the story, sadly. But that's how they did that regeneration. And as a little trivia for you, I found it interesting also, because I noticed this when I watched it, the very first thing John Pertwee does when he's the Doctor, when we first see him in Spearhead from Space, he falls out of the TARDIS, you know, coming from the regeneration. And then... The last thing he does uh, in the story, in the story of the Planet of the Spiders, he falls out of the TARDIS, and then says his says his final words, and then regenerates. So I thought that was a nice little interesting thing. Um, overall, the story is very good, has good characters, um, and oh wait, I've almost forgot. Mike Yates returns. If you remember Invasion of the Dinosaurs, Mike Yates betrays everybody. That was completely devastating. 
This one is his redemption story. He notices all these strange things going on at the meditation clinic and brings in Sarah Jane to tell, you know, he's being loyal again. They bring in Sarah Jane so he can tell the brigadier, she can tell the brigadier, and they bring the doctor in or everybody else. So, and then he helps out the way he can, and he risks his life a couple times, and actually, he does survive, but he does, uh, he does those things to where he, he almost think he could die, and he does actually redeem himself, and again, that is a good character development, and made me trust Yates yet again. It took a while, because at first, first couple episodes, I'm like, I don't really trust Yates. I'm not too sure about him. Well, by the end, I, I believed in him again, and I trusted him. So it was nice to, before, you know, the unit stories end. This isn't the final unit story yet, but you could tell by this point the unit story, the unit file, the family is ending. I mean, everybody's going away. Joe left. The master left. Uh, now John Pertwee's leaving. And now it's just the family's breaking up. So the they will end in the fourth Doctor's time, but it's nice that before they end, we got to forgive Mike Yates, and he got to find his redemption. So it's nice to have that. Uh, so, overall, story, characters, special effects were okay, but still needs a little work on. Uh, hopefully in future episodes they will be a little bit better. Um, animatronics were very impressive. Uh, spires were impressive. Everything was great and impressive. A good ending to the third Doctor. I can't believe it, it was so good. Um, I give this one... Four and a half stars out of five. It was completely beautiful. Um, and it's definitely one to watch, and is a great end and series 11 of Doctor Who. The third Doctor, overall, has been quite enjoyable. I liked him a lot. Um, I was quite impressed that he, it t took the very first story to me to fall in love with him. With the first Doctor, it took like three stories for me to get into him. The second Doctor took me like... Um, Oh, like, I think two stories for me to get to use to him. It was like, uh, um, yeah, it was like, I first saw him in the, uh, the moon base, and the second story I saw him in was the Tomb of the Cybermen, and Tomb of the Cybermen, I fell in love with him. Um, but with Pertwee, it was by the end of Spearhead from Space that I fell in love with him. I really liked him, and what sold me was his smile. I loved his smile. It was just this warm, becoming face that just, you know, welcomed you and just wanted to give, it was like a nice hug, and, uh, he was very suave and very, not macho, just gentlemanly suave and flamboyant and dressed, <laughs> even though he was flashy dress, uh, uh, dressed up, but he was very dandy, he looked, always looked nice, and he had this grace walk to him, and like I said, he was James Bond, just without the womanizing, <laughs> um, he had great stories, had great action and adventure. I mean, when those early episodes of his, that had, they continue on a little bit throughout the other ones, but when you got those great action scenes where Unit was fighting and, you know, harming people, and then the Doctor would do his uh, uh, Ventruvian, uh, uh, I forget what it's called, his own brand of karate, uh, Venusian uh, karate, it was so fun and exciting, and his deals with the Master, I mean, it was all just great fun, and I'm sad to see it all end. But I do have to admit, I can't wait to see one of the greatest Doctor of all, which is Tom Baker's Doctor. So, I can't wait to get to that one, and I, we'll see what he is. I mean, I have his bloody scoff, and I guess I uh, can't wait to see it in action. <laughs> and I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>